Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Unhinged Podcast. I am your host, Jay Dash, also known as Jim Mernier, alongside my co-host. Hey, what's up, guys? This is your part man, part machine, all podcaster, Carlos, a.k.a. the Wrestling Movie Guy. Back for another round of some XFL talk, because week two is right upon us. It's right around the corner. I don't know how excited you guys are, but I know that I am. So what do we got on the slate, James? Oh, we're going on a slate. We're going to go over each game, but we're not going to be like every other podcast that breaks down every single aspect of each game, uh, what's going to happen, and what can happen what that will determine our you know, decision on making the picks. There are other podcasts out there. There are thousands of them now. They've come out of nowhere, so you can go listen to them. Basically, how we're going to do this is based on rankings on huh, the news of the week, like controversy of the weeks, like crazy coaches and injuries and you know rabid fans, based our rankings on interest of the games. That's how we're going to pick our games this week. And we're not going to break down every single aspect. We might bring up stats, but we're not going to go too crazy. There are a lot of other podcasts out there that do just that. Um, so let's be a little bit different. Exactly. Go through the psychology of it. Correct. I, li- I like the sound of that. Before we get started, though, quick thing. Got to get the disclaimer or promo, actually, is the word I'm looking for out of the way. Remember, guys, if you are looking for some awesome old school XFL gear, go check out 503 Sports. They got the best stuff on the market. And you will be absolutely amazed at how authentic their gear is. Make sure that if you get something there, you type in Unhinged at the checkout line, and you're going to get 10% off. As always, please support our XFL family, the XFL Newsroom. Go check them out on Twitter. We're getting a lot of followers, and we really appreciate it. They've got over uh, 13,000 at this point. Me and James are almost at 1,000 ourselves, and we really, really appreciate you all's support. And if you want to help us out... Just a couple of bucks here and there to help us out, keep the show going, get new equipment, get uh, better sound equipment. If you go on Anchor, you can support us. You don't have to. This is always going to be free. We don't ever want to bug you guys. But if you want to help us out, a buck or two, that'd be what's up. But besides from that, as my boy James would say, let's get back on to the show. Let's talk some games. And the first game will be... One of the most controversial over the last week. Two teams that were without starting quarterbacks last week. One team firing anybody that's on the team because your ego was hurt. And the other team just limping away after a home opening loss to the Battle Hawks. This game is the Dallas Renegades and the Los Angeles Wildcats. So... I've been messaged by a couple people online and tweeted at what's unhinged about. Well, if you know the definition, sometimes we go off the rails and because of what happened in LA on Monday, I'm going a little bit, a little bit off the hooks here. I'm not going to go too crazy, but uh, coach Moss, Winston Moss, your ego got hurt. Your defensive mindset got hurt. So what do you do? You fire the defensive coordinator after one game. You're fired. Your you best, went full McMahon. Yeah. Your best defensive end asked for his release. So is this just a, you know overnight thing or it's just once in the blue moon let's go back a couple weeks ago when you traded away Luis Perez to the New York Guardians for nothing so I see a lot of the podcasts out there including some on our network that have all sided with what Winston Moss is like he knows what he's doing he's a head coach you tell me a coach who fires a defensive coordinator after one freaking game I don't care if it's the XFL. I don't care if it's the NFL. I don't care if it's college football or Pop Warner. I don't care. Yes, your ego got beat. You probably lost to the best team in the league right now because of Philip Walker going off on you guys. 
That doesn't mean that your DC is a bad coordinator. It means that your defensive strategy failed in the second half, which it did. Your defense kept you in that game as long as it did in the first half. So because your ego got hurt, Coach Moss, you decided to let your rage out on the defensive coordinator, which resulted in your best defensive end leaving. I know we have a lot of podcasts out there that love Winston Moss. He's a defensive-minded coach. He civilizes the city of L.A. But from what I've seen from him this week on Monday and what I've seen what he did two weeks ago with Luis, uh, with Luis Perez trade, I'm almost to a point to say Winston Moss is not – can I really do this? Is not capable of being a head coach at any level. It's too big for him. Yes, your ego got struck. One game. What does that mean? You're only one game out of the playoffs, but seeing how the Western Division is right now, you are currently tied for the last place in the division, which technically makes you make the playoffs. It's called panicking and overreacting after one game. Now, you're about to get ready for the Dallas Renegades, who lost opening game of the season to the Bowhawks. They're projected to be the number one team at the end of the year of winning the XFL championship. So what happens? Yes, they lost. You see Dallas panicking? Well, you see some of the fans panicking, but that's Dallas. They, they panic about anything, especially during the NFL season. They lose a week two game in the preseason. They're thinking the world's coming to an end. And the rest of America is enjoying their tears, just putting well, it in their tea. Well, especially the people around Philadelphia, D.C., and New York. Yay. Um, but the overreaction that we've seen on Monday from both sides, from Dallas and from mostly L.A., is shocking. Uh, because you name me a coach in any sport, I don't care if it goes all the way down to women's croquet or rugby, all up to the NFL or the EPL, whatever. NCAA. Do see, NCAA. Do you see head coaches, canon assistant coaches, after the first game. Extremely rare. You never really see it. All I'm picturing in my mind is an office with a fire going off and everybody's running in the same circle in a direct, you know, they're just bumping into each other. It's an absolute dumpster fire right now. And it's an absolute shame to say that because I, I, from my view, I didn't think they played that badly. I just thought they got outplayed and that oh. does happen. But to fire your defense coordinator after one game, and right away, one of your defensive ends rolls out. That's a pretty bad sign. And then so early in the season, wow. Like, it was quite a shocker to read that. Poor Pepper yeah. Johnson. I feel bad for him. Uh, it's the first week of the season. So when you look at week two matchups and you see, ah, Dallas versus L.A. I'm going earlier, Dallas. Earlier today, Landry Jones was confirmed by Bob Stoops of starting Week two, we knew about this on Sunday when uh, Pat McAfee on ESPN mentioned it as well. But now that it's official that Landry Jones is healthy, the Dallas Renegades are getting probably the best quarterback in the league back. That's like getting Tom Brady back after four weeks suspension over deflated footballs. Yeah, a little, it's a little early to say that, though. He well, hasn't even thrown a ball in this game yet. But still. He was. He's been advertised. He's been pumped. He's mm. been promoted as the face of the league, just like Cardell has been in D.C. and just as uh, Phil Walker has been promoted down in Houston. Well, just because you promote it doesn't mean it's a guarantee. Oh, exactly. I know what you're trying to get at, but I'm trying to say about you know the publicity, the promotions, and the commercial. Yeah. <coughs> Ryan Leaf. <coughs> mm, sorry. Uh, huh. <coughs> Okay, yeah, uh, good choice. <laughs> this would be a great league for Ryan Leaf if the XFL was around when he flopped out of San Diego. Um, but Debatable. we'll never it, know. It, even though we know what's going on in, in LA with the fiasco and, on Monday, it's calmed down a lot. They just signed a, a quarterback, a Marcus McCade, as a backup. He's just going to be filling up a role in there because it looks like Charles uh, uh, Kenoff is hurt may miss with this week but now there are rumors popping around when this podcast is out ladies and gentlemen they might be already uh, this rumor may already be news or maybe breaking but it sounds like josh johnson is going to give it a go on uh, this week even though he's not 100 healthy 
I think a that could be just he as a player wants to get on the field to you know play for his team, and b I think it could also be coaches um, trying to push him in, into the game because they think that this this is a dire need for them. To <sighs> God damn it. That That's so stupid on both sides. They need to protect him. He's their best chance of winning in this league. And it's foolish to get him out there before he's healthy. That is the sign of a desperate team clearly hitting the emergency button already. Break glass, you know, when there is a fire emergency. That they, yeah. They've broken the glass. They've taken out the fire extinguisher. And the fire's too big. Man. That is an absolutely foolish move on their part. And I need to remind L.A. fans. I know you guys had the uh, the extreme in 2001, completely different league. You have to remember, the extreme also lost their first game of the season back in the 2001 XFL version mm-hmm. and won the XFL championship. Also, you got to remember the Chicago Enforcers. They started the season 0-4. And finished out five and five and made the postseason. Yes, you can't lose your season after one week. You also can't win it all in the one week. But crap, Seattle might be an actual halfway decent team. They just may have had a bad game week one. You don't well, understand that. Of all the losing teams, they were definitely one of the better ones. Oh, yeah. But for LA fans, it's. Yes, I know you're trying to support the team, and I know you're trying to, you know, you know, get the energy of the city to get into the games um, in the upcoming this week and next week or the next five home games. Uh, you know, they put fans in the stands and understand that. But from the outside perspective as us, looking into the L.A. situation here at the newsroom and other XFL community podcasters, it's a dumpster fire now in L.A. Now it's like, okay, we know it's a dumpster fire. How are we going to stop it? But that story alone just pretty much, you know, takes over this game because, yes, Josh Johnson may come back. He may not be 100% healthy, but he's going to give it a go. Um, But, of course, you're going to hear rumors that, oh, the player wants to do it. Um, usually when the player has been hurt all the off season or in the training camps and he hasn't publicly come out and said that, oh, he feels good. Um, and the only thing you're hearing is coaches talk saying that that tells you that there could be some coaches, you know, you know, putting some little extra effort in it. But when we look at this game, Dallas is coming in with, uh, you know, Dallas, yes, lost to the battle Hawks, but it was more of a situation where, Philip Nelson couldn't throw the ball 30 down, 30 yards down the field. And in Bob Stoops offense, you need a deep threat. And Philip Nelson didn't have the arm strength to do that last week. But when you look at Dallas and LA, you got to look at all the question marks right now. And right now, a, I think, yes, LA might have talent on the team. They have a great receiver in uh, Nelson Spruce. They have an up and coming receiver in Jordan Smallwood, and they have uh, some you know great defensive talent. But the question is just not the talent on the team or the players on the team. It's the psychology so, yeah, the psychology of the team. Where are they at? Where's their mindset at? That locker room could be right now divided or broken or just completely shut out. And that could be the main reason or could be the key opponent of why L.A. loses this game to Dallas because Dallas, they're focused. They got their man back. They took it on the chin and they moved forward. That's because they have an experienced head coach like Bob Stoops, unlike Winston Moss, who just panicked. That sh- shows me a sign that a coach that's not 100% bought into his own idea of coaching, or he's falling back on his morals and he's panicking. And but, if you want me, but if you want me to pick the game, I'm not, I'm, not side, I'm not getting anywhere near L.A. in this one. I might later in the year when they play Dallas in Dallas later in the year, but right now, I, it's just too many good things happening for Dallas compared to all the hardship that L.A. is going through as of this moment. Yeah, whenever you have teams that have that going on in the locker room, that's always a distraction. It's never good. Things don't always turn out well at the end, but let's see Let let's see if Moss can figure this out because there's every chance in the world that he can get the team to rally and he can finally get a grip and finally start buying into what he's selling. But if you have a coach like that, players can smell it like sharks in the water. 
and that's going to mess with their head and make them not work as hard. So, yeah, definitely got the Wildcats losing this game to Dallas, who's trying to bounce back. But uh, what do you say we move on to the Vipers and the Dragons? Well, the Vipers and the Dragons match up, as I said. The news between these two teams is not as bad. There's really... Um, you give them out of Tampa Bay. They are having a quarterback situation right now. Uh, not a controversy. They're having this situation, meaning Aaron Murray has missed a couple of days of practice with a bum leg. Uh, Quentin Flowers has been getting a lot of the first team uh, work uh, reps. Uh, Taylor Cornelius has also gotten some reps. So the the Vipers are you know testing out different players. But I think if Murray is healthy, he'll start. Um, but you get a lot of people who look over the Tampa Bay game this past week and said, man, this is the worst team in the league. Well, they're 0-1, and yes, they're going to be in a lot of power rankings as number 8. Uh, but honestly, they had the most offensive yards of any team in the XFL. They drove the ball down the field from 20s to 20s with ease. They just couldn't get into the end zone because Murray was throwing an interception or Truesdale was dropping the ball after he was catching it, which is considered a fumble in a lot of sports leagues, including the XFL. But on Seattle's side, Brandon Silvers was at practice today. Looks like he is a go for Saturday. But the thing for Seattle is not the actual performance on the field. They were actually competent. Uh, uh, that geese speak English today, Jay. <laughs> uh, they were actually, uh, how can you say it? Not compliment. Um, they were a solid team. They yeah, just they, were decent. They, they just lost the plot at the end. But yeah. they didn't play horrifically or anything. They actually scored the first touchdown of the game. They held on to the lead for a good while. Their defense is uh, stifling. But eventually, we did figure them out. I don't know what exactly was going on with Zorn towards the end, but I don't actually think that that was on him, to his credit. I just think that, I don't know, the quarterback just seemed to slow down a bit. He couldn't make uh, the best passes towards the end. It was just as simple. They ran out of gas. Just no more than that to me. That can be uh, multiple factors. That can be, you know, flying across country. Um, getting used to the Eastern time zone, or also it can be that uh, DC's defender's defense is what we expected to be a very tough, stingy defense. And also it was just Brandon Silvers made a couple of mistakes, two interceptions and a pick six that were a main deciding factor in that game um, that resulted in the DC defenders winning uh, the season opener. But, what is positive about Seattle right now is that they are expecting 25,000-plus people in Century and Link Field, which was reported by SeattleTimes.com earlier this week. And there are some spokesmen with the Dragons think that they can get to 30,000 by kickoff on Saturday. That is a huge number. 30,000 will completely destroy every number of that any of the XFL teams have put up so far in the first week, the average is around 1,700, uh, 17,000 fans, but 30,000 fans in the home opener against the Vipers. And we should know if we watch all the Seattle sports over the history, um, they get rabid. They get crazy for all of their sports teams, university of Washington, the Seattle super, uh, Seattle Sonic or it used to be Seattle supersonics, the Seattle Sounders, the Seattle Seahawks, uh, the, in the Seattle Mariners, they love their sports teams. And they are and what, loyal. And they're loyal. So if you ask me, hey, say I'll put 25,000 fans in the stand, almost 30, what would they average throughout the year? Well, if they play a you know decent, maybe not win the division, but you know stay in that playoff contention throughout the year for that two spot, they'll put 25,000 plus in that stadium every single home game. That is Seattle, and that's a good sign. So, also this week, uh, there are some rumors going around right now that this transaction hasn't been complete. But CFL legend J or SJ uh, Green, who is a uh, a journeyman in the Canadian Football League with the Winnipeg and uh, Toronto and Montreal, the guy has over ten thousand yards receiving and over sixty Damn. touchdowns. Uh, he was picked up by the Seattle Dragons via the waiver wire on the XF, through the XFL. Um, there is a little hook up right now with that, possibly because right now is also the Canadian Football League free agency period. So all the teams in Canada are bidding for receivers. So 
That could be the hookup. But if Seattle does snag this guy, he won't be here for this week's game, but next week's game he will definitely be there when uh, the Dallas Renegades visit the Seattle uh, Dragons next week. Um, but when we look at Seattle and we look at Tampa, we've seen what Tampa did, Tampa Bay did in New York. And Tampa just now made the longest, I think it's the longest uh, road trip that an XFL team would take this year. And that is from Tampa to Seattle. And of course, if you choose Southwest Airlines, no plug here, but um, I kind of <laughs> did uh, see how if, see if any Viper fans will make the journey or trip. They do have a nonstop flight from Tampa to Seattle, which is kind of odd. Um, but when you look at this game, Tampa Bay has questions at the quarterback. I do believe, me personally, I think they may have to go Quentin Flowers to start. When he got in the game, he was moving the ball down the field against uh, New York, but never could really get it into the end zone because Trestman decided to put in uh, um, Aaron Murray and say, hey, you can do it. Here you go. Um, but if you look at it overall, this game, I'm just looking forward to the crowd. I want to see if Seattle does show out. And if Seattle does show out to what I think it is, I can tweet I can message all the AAF, remaining AAF fandoms that still bash the XFL. You know those people, ladies and gentlemen. They're the, <laughs> ones that, they're the ones that make the videos of how the XFL is going to fail this time. Those are the people. You can see their clips. They are former AAF hate, uh, homers. And they'll still say, well, San Antonio drew 30,000. Okay, um, well, let's, let's see what Seattle does, especially... I have a feeling that our St. Louis comrades will take the cake next week when they host. I think they host D.C. next week, if I'm right. Um, I have to check the schedule, but... Oh, no, the Guardians... Oh, no, no, the Guardians playing this week. Da, 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 da. I have the schedule yeah. just in front of me. It's uh, going to be Wildcats and Defenders in week three. Okay, so the Guardians are going to St. Louis... Next week, so that should be a big time game in St. Louis for a big time crowd. But that's next week's uh, conversation. But who do I have in this game between the Tampa Bay Vipers and the Seattle Dragons? Tampa Bay traveling to the West Coast. Tampa just got selected by Matt McGloin and the power eye, old fashioned pro style offense of Kevin Gilbride. I'm taking Seattle. I just don't see uh, anything that Tampa Bay does right now. The quarterbacks is not the answer. I do think that Seattle being home in that crowd in a raucous stadium, 30,000 people, that place is going to be loud. If you watch MLS games, ladies and gentlemen, the Sounders average around 30,000 fans a game in that in that building with a, with special state with special games that they release you know, open up the upper deck. Um, I think it's for like Vancouver and Portland, those rivalry games for Seattle. A uh, very raucous crowd. Look for Seattle to jump on them early, cause Murray or Quentin Flowers to make a couple of mistakes. I like Seattle in this one. And I think Seattle shows that they are going to be a team that's not just going to go away after the first season. And, and I think Seattle is going to be that dark horse now, seeing that everyone gave up on them after the first game of the XFL season just last week. I Give me the Seattle. Tampa's favored. Give me Seattle straight up. Yeah, I think I might have to go devil's advocate here. The one thing that concerns me the most is definitely the jet lag. But I do believe that the Vipers actually have something good going here. Every time they got – they were able to get to the red zone, but they would always throw a pick and, or just screw it up. I believe that if they go with Quentin Flowers, the more than likely win – he was on the field for only about eight plays, and he made about 56 yards, 22 through the air, 34 uh, through the uh, through the ground. So you got 56 yards right there, and the average is pretty good. I think that the run game was excellent with Patrick and Smith, 32 yards, 79 yards. It's right there. If, if they can just keep running the ball old school style and give themselves the best opportunity by not turning the ball over in the red zone, I think they have a pretty good chance to win. And I think that Williams might be able to go off again. He got to remember, he had six receptions for 123 yards, averaged 20 yards a catch. He could be a very major threat against the uh, the Dragons. So I'm actually going to have to go with the Vipers on this one. However, I'm going to do a goofy over-under. It all comes down to the jet lag. If they can get over the jet lag, I think they'll be all right. But if it does affect them, 
uh, that, that could do them in. We'll ah, see. So, so go Vipers. So you're going to go Vipers. So should I tell you some breaking news? Oh, God. What's it going to be? Breaking news. Connor Folk, who has been the XFL's version of Ian Rappaport, has just reported that Aaron Murray is out for Saturday's game against the Seattle Dragons. Oh, so Quentin so, Flowers, here we go. So it's Quentin Flowers. So that just was now tweeted out roughly six minutes ago. Um, so would you like to change your pick, or are you still riding with nah, the I'm Indians? sticking with it. That's what I was saying. If they play Quentin Flowers, they had a better chance to win. And here we go. Everything's falling into place. Feel bad for Aaron Murray, though. I hope he feels better soon. I did notice that he got hurt towards the end of the game. But, uh, hey, man, well wishes to you. Hope you feel better, Murray. But we got to move on. We got to get to the Battlehawks and the Roughnecks. Who you got in that? The Battlehawks and the Roughnecks are a battle between our 1-0 and teams. And the reason why this is our third game preview is honestly... Two individuals that I need to point out is Jordan Tiamu and P.J. Walker. Both these players were up for the reward for All-Star or Player of the Week or Star of the Week or All-Star Week, whatever uh, the XFL was doing. Um, the reason why this game is only number three is because, honestly, out of the three games or four games they're playing play this weekend, this one has me as the least interested game. And I know Battlehawk fans out there be like, whoa, well, you've been a naysayer for one, you know, day one about us. You know, you picked Dallas to beat us. Well, the reason why I think this is the, from my opinion, the least interesting game of the week is you're going to Houston. Houston looks like they're on fire. The offense I saw that you guys or the St. Louis team ran against Dallas, against Dallas' defense with Jordan Tiamu. Yes, you won the game, but you look bad at doing it you it looked like you guys didn't learn how to run the basic offensive play in training camp uh until like midway through the second half on houston's side of things they are banging out touchdowns right off the bat to start the game so when you look at this game it's going to be the battle between the two quarterbacks who makes more plays on the either by their feet or by air between jordan siamu and philip walker I think Phil Walker has more uh, deep threats than Sammy Coase and Sam Mobley. Um, I do believe that uh, Phil Walker has a better offensive line protection for him to make plays. The reason why I'll pick Houston in this game is because it's in Houston. And the reason why I like Houston in this game is I've seen St. Louis's offensive scheme against Dallas it just felt like if Dallas had Landry Jones, that game would have been one-sided towards the running, running gains. Yes, Jordan Tiamu is a first-year uh, a first year starter as a professional quarterback. Uh, he's going to go to a more hostile environment in Houston. Can't believe I'm saying hostile environment. But you about to expect the same size crowd there this week as you did last week. And everyone's talking about P.J. Walker, even me. Uh, I just, right now... My gut feeling tells me that the Houston Roughnecks are right now the supreme team in the XFL, uh, even one week after. They're the opposite from the L.A. Wildcats. Um, they actually are flying all cylinders, and they're getting weekly rewards. And the city of Houston is a buzz for the Roughnecks, which is also very positive. You're not getting that in L.A. Uh, give me the roughnecks in this one. I do think that Jordan Tiamu finds a couple of good offensive drives, makes it interesting, but I just think that Houston has too much firepower on the offense for the Battlehawks to keep up. I like Houston in a pullaway. Not a route, but a pullaway. Late score in the end of the fourth quarter makes it two, a two- or three-score game. But it'll be an interesting game until that point. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Uh, I'd have to have my money on the on the Roughnecks. They are by far the number one team. Although DC, I would say, is probably number two. They are very good. But, yeah, the Roughnecks at the moment are just on fire. But the other teams are paid to win and paid to figure out the other squad. Once you start pulling out your bag of tricks, other teams are going to know how to game plan for it and how many more tricks do the Roughnecks have in their bag. 
So I think Philip Walker, for now, will be able to continue to dominate. But the Battlehawks defense is nothing to slouch on. They did play pretty well. They held the Renegades to nine points. And as I said at the beginning of the year, their defense may be their best way of scoring, or at the very least keeping them in the game. And that's exactly what happened against the Renegades. But they didn't have Landry Jones. That wasn't what the offense was supposed to be. That wasn't what they were game planning for. That was just the game kind of thrown together. So I do believe that the uh, the Roughnecks are going to handle the Battlehawks. But I think I, I don't think the Roughnecks will score as many points as before. I think it'll probably be like a 24-19 to 19 kind of game. But still um, got to go Roughnecks. Uh, it's still a little closer than... Well, I predict it, but hey, I can't tell you who to pick. That's your man. Um, but the final game of the week is our game of the week. No, we're not biased to this because, yes, I my am. co-host is oh, a D.C. Defender <laughs> fan. The D.C. Defenders are hosting the New York Guardians in a battle of the Eastern Division. The winner will be all by themselves in first place in the East, it doesn't matter the results in Houston with St. Louis and St. Uh, St. Louis and Houston, because if St. Louis wins, they're two and zero with no division wins. The winner of DC and New York would be two and zero with either one division win or two division wins. This is a crucial first week or second week battle in the Eastern Division for the team to get a upper hand in the race for the top two spots, or, of course, home field advantage for that playoff game. The D.C. defenders are coming off a win over the Seattle Dragons while the New York Guardians took care of the Tampa Bay Vipers. Now we're in D.C., and it looks like ticket sales are about the same as last week. I could tell from listening to a couple of podcasts and listening to actual radio shows out of D.C., the energy for the defenders are still there. So, with that, I do expect this to be a little bit of a bigger crowd, a crowd that's more into it because it's a division game, and it's against an opponent from a familiar city for D.C., the rivalry between New York and Washington, D.C., should be a key factor. There are no major injuries to report, but we do know this. We are looking at two of the top-tier quarterbacks in the league, of, Mar- of Matt McGloin and Cardell Jones. The difference between the two quarterbacks, I think uh, Cardell Jones has more weapons than Matt McGloin. Matt McGloin is a more consistent passer than Cardell Jones. If you looked at the two games, Matt McGloin made more better reads on certain passes, given what the defense gives him, while Cardell Jones threw a lot of risky passes that uh, luckily were caught by his own guys but five yards to one direction or fade to the right or wrong direction could have been an interception or a turnover of possession. But this game is big because this is a first legitimate division matchup between two 1-0 opponents, and the winner gets the tiebreaker. And when a lot of people think of standings, like, well, it's only week two. Why are you looking at standings? Well, you beat your division opponent. Yes, you have a game lead over them because they'll be 1-1, one and, one, and you'll be 2-0. But technically, you have a two-game lead over them already because you have that lovely tiebreaker. And in a 10-week season, you need wins over your division opponents more than you need cross-division wins. For instance, Bob Stoops was interviewed after the Dallas game, after Dallas lost the St. Louis Battlehawks last week, and he mentions that. We took it on the chin, but hey, they are not in our division. We got to move on. Division games mean so much more. And in, in New York, and DC's game matter is a big time division game, especially between two teams that we expect will be there at the end. Most people on this network or here at XFL newsroom believe it's either going to be New York and DC in the Eastern uh, final. And it depends on who is home field advantage that will come down to games like this Saturday at 2 PM on ABC. We will see an Eastern division class between the guardians and the D.C. defenders. Now let's look at the field. Look at both teams. Both teams have good defenses. The question is, is who can make more plays on offense? My opinion is that D.C. has more offensive firepowers, especially in the receivers with Rashad Ross and Eli Rogers. 
Yes, the running back duo can do it with Pumphrey and Presley, but the question is, can one of these teams establish the run? I believe the team that establishes the run first, not like the NFL where you say, ah, oh, you know, whoever gets 100 yards rushing will win the game. And the, and the XFL will have like one running back that got over 88 yards this week, and I think that was Devon Smith of Tampa. I may be wrong, um, but I think it's either a Tampa Bay guy that did it. Uh, I think that whoever establishes the run in this game will dictate the tempo, will dictate the terms of the game, and especially D.C. You want to take care of your home opponents. You're about to go on a two-game road trip. Win this game at home. You control, basically, you control the Guardians from passing you in the division. It's a key game. Division games are huge. These are usually what a lot of coaches do in the, in the coaches speak. Call it plus one. You got the game, and it's division plus one, which is a two game uh, swing. The que- my hope is that we get a good game. If we get, let's say, I know a lot of people out there will be like, what type of game do you want to see? I'll love to see like a St. Louis versus Dallas type of game here in New York or here in D.C. for the D.C. and New York game because that will hold a different narrative compared to that game in Dallas because we get two one and no teams. This is the division game. It means more. But also, we a lot of people would say, oh, I'd rather see like the L.A. versus Houston game, one team blowing out the other. Possibly could see that. But I just don't see a um, Matt McGloin offense, Kelvin Gilbride's pro-style offense, and his mindset of slowing down the game. It's one thing I noticed against Tampa Bay last week. He went up-tempo, but he knew when to slow it down to stop Tampa Bay from getting any groove on defense. That is going to be key against D.C., I think D.C. will try to do what Pep Hamilton's offenses are meant to do. A lot pro-style, uh, RPO-style offense. They were trying to establish that against uh, uh, St. Louis last week. Not St. Louis, excuse me, Seattle last week. And, you know, made a couple plays. You know, you had the trickery. Then you had uh, freaking Cardell just dropping dimes to Ross and, and Eli Rogers throughout the game. So this game, I think, can either be a very close defensive battle or I think it could be a shootout because both teams are capable of both. And I think it will come down to who is the better quarterback, Matt McGloin or Cardell Jones. Uh, I feel the same way, uh, although I don't think it's going to come down as much to the run as you think it will. I think that both defenses are going to be able to stifle the run game, and both of them are going to have to abandon that and just toss the ball willy-nilly. And we're going to have, a, like you said, a shootout at the end. I agree with that. Uh, one thing though, I don't understand why people want to see another blowout. You know, the league doesn't want to see that. The better games are the ones that are closer. I mean, blowouts are fun when your team wins, but you can't have every single game go like that. Although my DC side would like to see a blowout, but as far as the betterment for the league it, to be legitimized, we need to have closer games. Otherwise, people are going to dismiss it. Because if you don't have really competitive games, it's like one side's really good, just beating down on the other one. Uh, not unlike the uh, the NBA, where you have the West just constantly dominating over the East. Of course, the NBA has over 50 years of being a staple in America and basketball being a staple in the world. Uh, the XFL does not have that clout. So for them, the... Uh, the, the amount of time that they have to get this right is much shorter. So we need to have closer games. We need the Vipers and the Dragons to be closer. Same with Battlehawks, Roughnecks, all of that. Uh, blowout here and there is fine, but we can't have that throughout the league. You know that Vince and, uh, what's his face, Oliver Luck are definitely hoping for closer games. High scoring, but closer games. We can't have like 16 to 6 or something like that. That's not going to be any good. But I'd say right now, my money might actually be on the Guardians to win this because that defense, as you said, just slowed the game down and really just shut down the Vipers. Now, the Vipers definitely got in their way quite a bit, but they got talent there. So to be able to shut them down to three points is pretty damn impressive. The defenders gave up 19 points. It's a big difference there. I think maybe over under, you know, two and a half point favorites, I'd say, for the... Uh, for the Guardians, it'll be a lot closer than the Vipers game, but I think that uh, both defenses will beat the hell out of the run game. Both teams are going to toss it up, and we could have a 28-24 game, something like that. Well, 
you rather have a shootout than a one sided blowout if you're trying to sell the product. Exactly. Um, yeah, you can have a defensive game. I, I don't mind seeing that either. Um, but you have New York winning the game, which yeah, that's your opinion, and I'm not going to challenge it. But I am not no homer. I am not biased to this. But I see the Guardians falling in this game because I think D.C. and Cardell Jones makes plays with his feet at the end of the game to extend the game and extend drives that New York needs to get, you know, D.C. off the sideline and off the field. I mean, yeah, off the field. Why does I say sideline for it? She, that's, <laughs> what you, that's what you get on this show sometimes. I go on little rambling rants, and I have no idea what I'm talking about at times. Um, but I look at D.C. making more plays at the end. I'm just siding with D.C. because of the home team here. Um, I know this is going to be the second consecutive week. I'm picking all home teams, but who cares? I'm picking home teams. Um, and hopefully that DC, if DC plays like they did against Seattle, they'll win this game. Um, and if, and if, uh, New York plays like they get against Tampa, I think we're going to have a, a very good, exciting game where we're not two minutes into the second quarter. wondering why the score is six to three. Um, I think we might actually see some high scoring affair in this one. Um, but speaking of Guardians, we had a fan question given us today by Lee Rollins. And he asked us via the XFL Unhinged Twitter account what is the Guardians logo? Well, the Guardians logo, sir, is very, very, very unique. Back in the Gothic days, Guardians were considered Guardians or Gargoyles. Gargoyles, or yeah. <laughs> or considered Guardians of churches. They chased away demons who were trying to enter the church. So, in a lot of Big time buildings or older buildings in New York have, you know, gargoyle sta- uh, statues on top of them. They're guardians of the city. So technically, they just use that as a representation of the New York as their logo. And uh, that's what it's supposed to be. But don't diss the logo. The logo is actually pretty sick. I like the logo. You know, I'm not actually sure if that guy was actually being serious or not. I kind of felt like I was in a G.I. Joe episode. A gargoyle was the guardian of New York. The more you know. Enjoy your history lesson. I'm kind of wondering if this guy was just messing with us. He was like, I wonder if they'll actually answer the question. <laughs> like, maybe he knows full well what it is. But yeah, it's it's a goddamn gargoyle. I mean, I grew up with the show in the 90s. I, always, I, I just kind of figured everybody knew that. But I'm sorry, Mr. Lee Rollins. If you were serious with that question, I apologize for joning on you. But I kind of get the feeling you were just fucking with us. <laughs> well, I, you know, I did some investigating reporting. Literally, I just clicked on his name and see what he's been tweeting out. And he is a Defenders fan, so I kind of think that it's now the question has been like a, like what you mentioned. So, what is a guard girl logo? The Guardians logo. <laughs> Maybe I can actually get him to explain the whole history of gargoyles on the show. It's a DC Defender fan trolling on the podcast, which is doesn't mind. At least he's being interactive. I, I really don't care. At least we, we appreciate it. Any, any listeners is awesome. We really do appreciate it. Near, <laughs> uh, near a thousand. But also today, the XFL officially announced the location of the XFL championship game. A lot of people out there are saying, well, they should name it the X-Bowl. No, they should not aim at no damn expo. What the hell are you people talking about? That sounds terrible. That's yeah, I'd rather have like that's worse than the million dollar game. I don't know, I kinda missed that one. Um, but I see a lot of people on Twitter and other social media sites saying, Why is the game in Houston for? Houston's getting everything. Well, Oliver Luck is from Houston. Oliver Luck started the Houston Dynamo. Oliver Luck basically knows everything about Houston. And Houston has treated the XFL very, very well and has opened up their arms and welcomed this our league. 
two there. Every team had their training camp there, right? Every team. Yep. And yes, TD ECU Stadium is you know forty thousand people. Yeah, it's a little bigger stadium than what the XFL is averaging right now. But what does that mean ten weeks from now, where you know we might have Houston fans and a good contingent of DC fans go down to Houston or any of the other league team players going down to Houston for this event? I think it's a good size event. Tickets haven't been announced yet. But with the announcement of the championship game, that puts all the rumors away about teams like the higher seed hosting. Or what I've seen on Twitter over the last couple of months is like, oh, they should put the championship game at neutral sites. I know we mentioned Las Vegas, but that's basically as far as we went was Las Vegas, which I still love the Las Vegas idea. That would be a hell of a trip to go to Las Vegas, go to the XFL championship game, and lose about five grand because I'm stupid at gambling. Um, <laughs> but, yes, I understand having it in Houston. Uh, Oliver Luck is very familiar with the area. I understand that. But the backlash I'm seeing some of the fans is ridiculous. They announced a neutral site game. The reason why they did this is so you, the fans, know exactly where the game is. So you can buy tickets and get your airfare there or travel plans there. So you're not you're not going, oh, what the hell was doing after the championship weekend? I don't know. Oh, are we go- are we going to DC? Are we going to Dallas? Are we going to Houston? Are we going to St. Louis? This actually gives us where the location of the game is. It's like the Super Bowl. We know where the location of the Super Bowl is next year. It's Tampa, Florida. You hear people complain about that? Well, not really, because it's the Super Bowl and it's the biggest event in America. But but being getting all in the dither because Houston's getting all the love from the XFL, you have to sit back and go, wait a minute, what has Houston done for the XFL? They've done everything. And it's just right for them to host it. And do I mind it moving maybe to another city here and there? Maybe down the road. But Houston got it because they allowed everything to happen in Houston. All the training camps, all the mini camps. Houston has opened up their arms and go, XFL, we're going to help you out here. We have a lot of nice facilities here in the, in the city. And they did so. They have like like five football stadiums that can hold 30,000 people or more within five miles of each other. It's ridiculous that Houston, what Houston is. And Matt Props. And I, and I know the ref who is a part of the XFL newsroom, he's a... He's stoking right now because he doesn't have to leave his city to go to the XFL championship game. So that's pretty awesome for him. A lucky bastard. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's the little news that you get that the XFL makes and you have some of the fans that are like, oh, this is awesome. This is great. And like us earlier in this, early in their show, we kind of bash Winston Moss. I think we're the only podcast that's bashed Winston Moss. And I'm, I'm, I'm still going to say it. I still think he is not right to be a coach there if he's acting like a kid after one loss. But but then again, I'm that type of guy that's following the company line here in the uh, XFL championship game. I absolutely agree of it having been in Houston. You know the location. You know when to get plane flights or airfare. Even though if your team may not get there, at least you know where it's at. It gets you prepared to do that. And plus, the city of Houston deserves it, in my opinion, from all the hospitality they have shown the XFL over the last couple of months. But with that, I know we are kind of getting a little over. We're not going to make it as long as earlier this week's episode. But get ready for back-to-back podcast, meaning we'll have one drop in here on Monday after week two. And you'll get one that drops on Friday before the games of the week. Um, remember, ladies and gentlemen, you can follow us at XFLRN or NR Unhinged on Twitter or at XFLnewsroom.com. And also go visit our Anchor site where you can listen to all of our shows via Anchor that gets sent to Spotify and Apple. We have hit over, I think, 500 listens over our last couple of episodes and our YouTube channel is just rocking with XFL Newsroom. We are the second to third. Well, can we bash Tron for this? Because we're technically 
over the last couple of days the second most watched podcast on the on the network but he's technically second most as he has more numbers over the long term yeah what does that matter i don't really consider it much of a competition i mean it's just I do. We're, we're, we're all part of the xfl family the more views I, for all I, of us I, I it's better for it. everyone be number one <laughs> Fair enough, but let's not bash anybody. It just seems like a dick move right there. <laughs> Don't bite the hand that feeds, you know what yeah, I mean? <laughs> it's, it's Tron. He can get over it. But with that, Tron Hawkins will be joining us on Monday's show to discuss some XFL. Hi, <laughs> we just crapped on you. Welcome to the show. Uh, How was week two? Uh, we'll, we'll get him on the show on Monday. We're going to talk about the quarterback situation in uh, Tampa. Um, but saying that now that Aaron Murray's news just dropped during this podcast. We might know the answer come Monday. Um, That he will be joining us on Monday's podcast after week two. But besides from that, um, we're done here, aren't we? Or do you want to talk about that? Always remember, check out 5 or 3 Sports if you want your kick-ass old-school 2001 XFL gear. Type in Unhinged in the checkout room for 10% off. Make sure to follow us at XFL Newsroom. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, XFL Unhinged, if you want to check me out as well. I don't have anywhere near as many followers as these guys do. Maybe it's because I'm the sidekick. But hey, feel free to follow me at Wrestling Movie G if you like. You're not a sidekick. You're just a part <laughs> of this podcast, too. Yeah, I put myself as uh, more like a Nightwing than a Robin supporting character. And speaking of supporting, if you want to help us out, throw a couple of bucks if you feel like it. Go to anchor.com. There's a button there to say uh, support this podcast. Yeah, every now and then, if you want to throw us a couple of bucks, feel free. It'll go right into the show. It's going to give us more cash, get better sound equipment, and just help produce a better show overall. But minimum as long- donations, <laughs> minimum, minimum donations of a million dollars will be accepted. That might be a bit much, Dr. Evil. I might <laughs> want to slow down and get that pinky off your lip right there. Yeah. But yeah, if you want to help us out, go for it. If not, the show will be free, as always, and we appreciate y'all's support. And I think we're ready to call it a day. We'll call it a day when I say we call it a day, damn it. Yeah, we'll call it a day. We'll see you guys Monday. (laughs) Do it. We got to get the hell out of here. I'm sure they're tired of us. (laughs) Peace. Later, guys. Peace.